lecture number 7 uh, it's going to shed light on the south asian context that why uh, discussing the south asian context is so relevant so far as the broader topic of water society and sustainability uh, are concerned so while we are actually uh, recording this series of lectures on one hand on the other hand uh, the niti ayog report on composite water management index have just been released and uh, it's a it's a report that you know provides lot of warning about what is going on in the water uh, scenario in india during our contemporary times and it says that india is actually facing its worst water crisis these days and uh, the composite water index uh, scores it shows uh, it, it it had assessed the high performance and medium performance and low performance state so from this map uh, you can see that these are the, the, the red ones, these are the low performance states, the green ones, these are the high performance states and the yellow ones, these are the medium performance states. So, the indicators that had been considered to uh, uh, come up with this composite water management index are groundwater restoration, irrigation management, uh, on farm water use, drinking water supply, water policy frameworks and all these very important uh, uh, parameters. So, these all these indicators have been considered and they have come up with this uh, very recent composite water index score uh, which shows the that the uh, performance of most of the states uh, is actually pathetic and it is not only uh, uh, shedding lot of light or drawing our attention on the rural sector but also the urban sector as well so we will see a very small uh, clip or a video on uh, this particular report or uh, some of the key highlights or fun findings from this uh, Niti Ayog report. So, let us just watch this small clip. The Niti Ayog announced on Thursday that India was suffering the worst water crisis in its history. According to its composite water management index report, the crisis is only going to get worse by 2030. The demand for water in India is projected to be twice the available supply, implying an eventual 6% loss to the country's GDP. We are currently standing in Deoli area of New Delhi, which is considered Asia's biggest unauthorized colony and one of Delhi's driest. The taps here do not have any water. But Delhi is not the only place that is suffering from a water crisis. According to a report released by the Niti Aayog today, India is currently suffering from its worst water crisis in history. The report, which is titled Composite Water Management Index, ranks states according to various aspects like availability of drinking water, groundwater, as well as policies made by the state government with regard to management of water resources. According to this report, Gujarat has come out as the best performing state, followed by Madhya Pradesh and Andhra Pradesh. Meghalaya, on the other hand, has come out as the worst performing state. The more jarring facts that the report has come out with, 2 lakh people in India die every year due to inadequate access to safe water. 75% households do not have access to drinking water on their premises. 84% rural households do not have access to piped water supply. And if the situation continues to remain as bad, the forecast is that by 2030, 40% of India's population will not have access to drinking water. And by 2020, 21 cities like those of Delhi, Chennai, Bengaluru and Hyderabad will not have access to groundwater, affecting nearly 100 million people. In New Delhi, this is Sukirti Duvedi for NDTV. So, we can understand how shocking uh, the entire scenario is and uh, this data is really shocking and it is quite frustrating to learn that India is really going through its worst water crisis. So, this is the uh, current scenario right now. On the other hand, uh, I mean before uh, moving into like what are the grand initiatives and uh, plans that are being uh, considered or that are being implemented that are being pl uh, getting planned to get implemented we will uh, just focus on the uh, from a little bit of theoretical perspective uh, that why uh, focusing on the south asian context remains important so one we have already seen the uh, present scenario uh, i mean present water scenario so far as uh, the entire indian subcontinent is concerned now on the other hand 
and we will be discussing the grand plan schemes and initiatives uh, that are uh, being perceived, conceived and also that are uh, you know being planned to get implemented uh, across the national sector affecting the national sector as well as uh, you know uh, having transboundary transnational implications as well. On the other hand, now I will be basically focusing on uh, I mean little bit of theoretical conceptualization on why then we think that South Asia should get a little bit of you know uh, more focus should be emphasized uh, as an unit of uh, analysis when we are actually focusing on water society and uh, sustainability as a whole. So, uh, this is a paper uh, which was uh, um, written by uh, uh, me and uh, one of my uh, uh, students. It is called Environmental uh, Towards Environmental Humanities Relevance Approaches and uh, Agenda within the Indian context. So, here uh, we try to come up with two arguments that why we think uh, specifically Indian and broadly South Asian context uh, should be incorporated within the broader ambit of environmental uh, humanities that is the broad umbrella discipline that is the broad uh, you know uh, environmental uh, discipline these days that talks about uh, converging both uh, methodologies and methods across natural and social sciences. So, the first argument that we made is that uh, we should include or incorporate South Asia within environmental humanities because the South Asian context is uh, very divergent from the West. So, you can see that and why this uh, 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 context is divergent because it has this I mean it is encountering uh, the environmental problems that other regions are encountering as well. Like for example, the western countries the problems being encountered by western countries are also uh, I mean the Indian people or the South Asians they are also encountering similar set of problems. But in addition South Asia encounters additional vulnerability. Now, additional vulnerability connected to the long historical past of colonial intervention, this is very important. So, we had already encountered uh, colonialism and subjugation, domination and most importantly these uh, you know uh, intervention or the uh, or colonialism, the colonial legacy actually had continued even during the post independent uh, years. Uh, especially against profound and prominent functioning of transnational uh, aid agencies. So, we need to understand that uh, South Asia uh, faces additional vulnerability uh, with its you know long inherited past of uh, colonialism and the uh, uh, continued legacy of the colonial uh, policies during uh, our post independent times and when we have new players other uh, players in scene most importantly the transnational aid agencies including the World Bank. World Trade Organization, IMF, etcetera. So, this is one reason why we need to uh, focus on uh, uh, South Asia. And uh, the second point is that it is uh, the second point is also very relevant because uh, we have argued that South Asia offers rich historical traditions of ecological and humanistic knowledge. Now, the idea is to not to the idea is not to uh, romanticize or you know um, uh, say that uh, South Asia had a golden ecological past, but rather uh, to make a point that the traditions or the uh, you know ecological knowledge uh, that we had you know those should be explored because those uh, give lot of examples to us that how we can actually uh, you know have a, a, a reconciliatory relationship or interaction uh, with nature. So, because uh, this e ecological and humanistic knowledge of our past during the pre-colonial uh, period to a great extent it is the history of metabolism between nature and society and here more specifically water and society. So, it is important for us to look into the Indian or broadly South Asian context to uh, you know explore the historical traditions of ecological and humanistic knowledge and wisdom that were and this is again another argument uh, which is little political and extremely important that is this knowledge had been deliberately not provided agency with or accorded importance due to political reasons like enforcing a cultural hegemony and economic maneuvers. So, you can understand that I am actually hinting at uh, uh, you know uh, the politics that had led to the bifurcation or categorization uh, of first world and third world so called developed and underdeveloped or developing for that matter. So, how our rich knowledge how uh, the ecological pre colonial ecological and humanistic knowledge of the past had not been accounted or had been had not been uh, to a great extent uh, highlighted and how this 
uh, project had actually remained political. So, again I am emphasizing that the idea is not to romanticize our quote unquote golden past, but the idea is also to get explored to like what were the systems, what were the techniques, what were the practices and policies that were there before South Asia could encounter with the colonial rule. So, yes, this is an elaboration of the same uh, where I uh, uh, would like to argue that we should interpolate uh, South Asia or incorporate South Asia, uh, you know, while discussing uh, environment, while discussing water uh, specifically, because South Asian scene is huge, diverse, and complex, loaded with colonial encounters, followed by decolonized ideologies of development. Which means that you know uh, when uh, this colonial rule ended uh, and uh, the, con the country uh, in particular and the and different countries uh, of global south in general became decolonized, then of course there were these decolon uh, decolonized desires or uh, ideologies or for that matter sometimes imposition of the development discourse. So, this is there and finally, another important uh, very pertinent point is this trans boundary complexity, because we need to keep in mind. So, I am not saying India, I am basically saying South Asia, because if I say South Asia, then I will be able to highlight that you know South Asian rivers or South Asian ecosystem. It means that it is, uh, it, uh, I mean these ecosystem uh, are sometimes these ecosystem resources are shared ecosystem resources. The rivers are the shared rivers. For example, the Ganges basin or the Brahmaputra basin basin, these are shared river basins, so which we need to keep in mind. So, there should be some kind of a multilateral, uh, you know multilateral cooperation uh, at the basin level. So, uh, we need to understand uh, this trans boundary complexities uh, when we uh, have to focus on South Asian rivers, because these are South Asian rivers uh, or not Indian or Bangladeshi uh, river uh, in particular, but rivers which are shared uh, you know uh, by different uh, nations. So, this is one and the uh, second point as I mentioned that we also really need to be aware of the knowledge, expertise and wisdom uh, that is there uh, in, this, uh, in the in the you know ancient South Asian tradition. So, uh, because we, re we need to you know unveil or we need to move beyond mainstream uh, so called quote unquote modern western Eurocentric paradigm. And we also need to see whether these practices, whether these techniques, whether these policies uh, today can be implemented at scales, whether they have the potential to get operated or to be operated at scale and whether they really have the transformative potential. So, in order to assess and in order to map that, first we need to explore uh, this uh, you know array of practices that are available in, uh, in uh, within the South Asian context before South Asia could encounter with the colonial rule. Yes. So, this is again the uh, present context, uh, the grand uh, initiative. Uh, the uh, major plan or uh, the major dream that uh, uh, India is uh, uh, dreaming at and this is the interlinking of river project, which is uh, considered as I mean the largest project not only uh, I mean uh, so not only in India, but uh, in the world. So, because you can see from this map that there are uh, different components within this project. So, one is this Himalayan component, uh, the northern component and the other one is this uh, southern uh, component or the peninsular uh, component. And uh, So, it is uh, being uh, carried forward or being conceived and carried forward uh, under the ages of the uh, National Water Development Agency. Uh, there are as I mentioned there are different components within the project. So, like 14 interlink projects for the Himalayan component in the north, 16 interlink projects for the peninsular component in the south and apart from there, the, the, there are also like uh, 37 intrastate river linking projects. So, it is a very, very big, it is a mammoth uh, project as a grand, so called grand. I do not know whether grand or not, because grand is again a kind of a subjective uh, term, but uh, it is mentioned that it is a grand initiative, it is a mammoth project with so many components involving multiple stakeholders and, of course, huge, huge, huge costs. 
Now, uh, these uh, interlinking of rivers, it is, uh, it has not happened suddenly. It is not a, you know, sudden development uh, in the Indian uh, uh, water policy framework, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there is a historical context, we will come to it. But one important point is that uh, once this particular project was conceived, immediately there was whole lot of debate, there was a hot bed of controversy among uh, the scientists, the experts, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the protest groups groups and organizations that whether this project is a feasible project or not or whether this project would ultimately benefit the Indian water scenario and the Indian people um, at large or not. So, the whole uh, debate was surrounding whether to link or not to link the rivers. So, this is uh, um, the whole uh, argument all about like uh, you know people uh, giving uh, pointing out uh, different numerical facts and figures uh, justifying the implementation of the project or different components of project. On the other hand, there are of course, you know uh, these uh, radical uh, 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 groups and organizations and also scientists uh, pointing out that no, it is going to be a quote unquote I am quoting Medha Patkar, it is going to be a millennium folly and a disaster and a fiasco. So, the debate is surrounding whether to link or not to link the rivers and you will find many works, many you know uh, b b I mean different reports, uh, different book chapters and articles uh, on I mean whether these uh, grand initiative is going to uh, benefit the Indian water uh, sector or uh, the Indian society for that matter at large or not. Because uh, the whole idea as we all know is uh, I mean uh, uh, India has uh, both water scars and water flush region. So, um, uh, this uh, idea is the idea is to transfer water from the water flush region to the uh, water scarce region through inter basin uh, and inter uh, intra basin transfer of water. So, this is the idea that uh, the I mean and in that way uh, the ultimate uh, purpose is to basically increase the area of uh, um, irrigated land and why this is important because it is predicted uh, by the uh, by scientists that by 2050 India is going to have major uh, crisis uh, in uh, the, the uh, production of food grains. So, it is very important to uh, bring more and more uh, lands um, uh, under the irrigated area. So, the only option to this is basically uh, you know to um, uh, come up with a project that can uh, you know to a great extent uh, make possible the transfer of water from water scars uh, to water flush region. So, this is the idea all about, but you know there are lot of social concerns and there are lot of environmental concerns that are going on uh, because you know uh, these uh, scientists uh, they have come up with reports and publications which show that if even part of the uh, project is implemented, then it would lead to massive uh, displacement and uh, it will incur massive social costs. And on the other hand, not only it will affect uh, people at large or it will not only affect the uh, people in the project sites, but it will also uh, to a great extent affect the environmental flows, which is called the e-flows. So, e-flows in river system. So, it will affect aquatic uh, ecosystem, uh, wildlife and uh, disrupt the entire ecological balance in the river. So, if you go through uh, some of these articles which are cited in the reference list, you will be able to find out the hardcore concrete empirical uh, you know um, uh, arguments uh, or empirical facts uh, uh, which shows that how it is going to uh, incur both uh, you know huge ecological and social cost. And another important thing is that beyond or apart from ecological massive ecological and social costs, the project one has to keep in mind that it is a grand project or it is a matter of South Asian proportion. This is what which needs to get highlighted because we are saying it, it is interlinking of rivers in India, but it is going to affect the entire South Asian basin. So, this is not uh, uh, you know uh, getting lot of stress or emphasis in uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, reports or some of the uh, publication which is actually uh, justifying uh, the implementation of uh, ILR. So, we need to keep in mind that it is a matter of South Asian proportions because I had already mentioned that South Asia is also loaded with transboundary water and river complexity. So, it is a matter of South Asian proportion, uh, we need to really come up with an international legal framework before we start implementing um, uh, ILR. 
So now uh, parts, uh, I mean portions of ILR or different components of ILR um, are all uh, are becoming ready to get implemented. For example, uh, you know the Kane Betwa uh, link project that will be implemented very soon. So it is almost ready. But then the question is whether an international legal framework has been chalked out before that. So maybe the argument might be that I mean their uh, um, MOU has been signed between the states. Uh, 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 I mean uh, the for which will be affected or positively or negatively due to Kane Betwa uh, link uh, project. But then the whole question is that uh, before coming up with an international legal framework, it is uh, I mean it is not quite justifiable uh, to implement even uh, different components that are there within the ILR. So, the idea is that uh, unilateral decision by the Indian nation unfortunately is being taken for a multilateral project. So, this should not be the case and this is one of the major or uh, one of the staunch criticisms uh, uh, that this particular project is facing during the recent times. So, now come to the question of that we know that uh, it is going to incur huge uh, social and um, ecological costs, uh, but still why then are we so interested uh, in uh, the implementation of ILR. Because Jointo Bandopadhyay and uh, Parveen in their 2003 uh, paper, uh, they argued that is arithmetic expansion in irrigated land the only possible solution towards maintaining India's food security. So, as I mentioned earlier that the uh, uh, logic or the objective one of the major objectives uh, behind the implementation of ILR is that it is saying that it is important to uh, important because uh, I mean it can take care of the supply of food grains by expanding the area of irrigated lands. Now, Jointo Bandapada and Parveen they raise this question that is this the only option? Can't we think about other small scale options uh, that can you know um, operate at scale and that can have the same uh, uh, implication, but uh, that can actually um, I mean reduce the social cost. So uh, this is the argument that they are raising a very important, a very pertinent uh, question. But then the question is still why are we not you know uh, uh, giving or why are we not putting uh, 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 much of our thoughts in these ideas? Rather, we are going for you know towards I mean justifying this entire uh, uh, this mammoth project or initiative. Now, from a social science perspective, here I would like to argue and emphasize that if we need to look into the bigger question of why even after uh, you know having uh, so many uh, uh, ramifications ILR is being uh, conceived that and is being implemented, then we really need to understand uh, technological interventions uh, not only as a linear progression, but also we need to look into the larger historical and political processes that are at play that are at work uh, behind you know implementation of particular technologies during particular periods of time. So, so what I am saying is that uh, ILR also needs to be contextualized within South Asian hydraulic interventionist trajectory. Yes, and I mentioned interventionist we can uh, of course debate on this uh, because I would like to say that ILR is not a rapid or a sudden development, but it can be contextualized against what had already happened since the last few centuries within the history of South Asia or within the water history of South Asia. So, as I mentioned earlier also that South Asian waters had encountered colonial intervention and why this is so important will be elaborated in uh, the next couple of lectures that I am going to deliver with the uh, South Asian focus in mind. So, this is one second is that uh, after the uh, end of the colonial rule, when India became decolonized, when India entered into the post independent period, then unfortunately this legacy continued because you know this uh, technology it uh, kept on advancing and the, along with the advancement in the mode of production. So, capitalism from one phase to the other. So, this we, uh, these political processes, these economic uh, processes we need to keep in mind when we uh, actually need to uh, map, assess, evaluate, explore and understand you know technological interventions including interlinking of rivers. So, so colonialism and South Asian waters then 
colonial legacy, continued colonial legacy, colonial le uh, continued legacy of modernist western big scientific hydraulic management discourses policies, uh, policies and practices. So, uh, uh, yes as I was mentioning that this uh, uh, colonial period is so important because it is radically altered our relationship uh, with nature more specifically water as well. Okay. So, uh, the uh, I mean pre colonial attitude or the uh, pre colonial uh, uh, metabolic uh, relationship or the metabolism between water and society it actually uh, transformed to the metabolic rift between water and society. So, so we will discuss all these in details I will elaborate all these you know uh, theoretical tractions with empirical investigations detail empirical facts and data when we will be focusing into what happened uh, during the colonial period what had been the history of hydraulic interventions uh, when uh, South Asia encountered the colonial rule. And uh, then uh, this particular term has been used by uh, Rohan de Souza in his uh, 2006 uh, article he says that it is colonial hydrology because I mean uh, he says that uh, the South Asian experience so far as water is concerned it comprises of a very different experience uh, you know uh, which is so radically different from uh, its experience uh, during the pre-colonial times. So, colonial period we find this massive big uh, projects on our rivers on our water bodies including embankment. So, the, uh, the first period is, uh, uh, is the period or the era of the construction of embankment followed by the era of uh, you know perennial irrigation systems followed by multi purpose river valley development projects. Now, multi purpose river valley development project it uh, I mean these were conceptualized during the 1940s and uh, these uh, were implemented at scales across all the major rivers in India since the post independent period. And of course, the consequences and implications uh, had been huge and severe and uh, like uh, if you go through the uh, works of the different environmental uh, for that matter water historians of South Asia, uh, you will find that they had covered in detail uh, like what had been the impacts or implications and consequences of uh, these hydraulic interventions uh, on the ecology and the um, uh, society of um, I mean uh, the nation at large, uh, but also you know uh, the other nations um, uh, uh, so far as South Asia is concerned and here I am saying that uh, like uh, I am mainly talking about environmental historians uh, of I have written of South Asia, but it is specifically you know the Indian context and here South Asia and India uh, gets overlap uh, get overlap sometimes, because you have to keep in mind that uh, before 1947 uh, Indian subcontinent it, uh, it meant I mean Indian subcontinent comprised of uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. So, uh, so if you go through uh, uh, one of my chapters that is again cited in the reference list. Uh, yeah, so, there I have done a historiography on the history of waters in India and you will uh, find out uh, I mean the implications uh, or consequences of uh, colonial hydraulic interventions um, uh, uh, in South Asian ecology and society at large. And uh, if you want to come up with I mean if you want to uh, know the uh, uh, you know uh, what happened during the contemporary times in the post independent period. Uh, so, far as the implementation of multipurpose river valley development schemes and projects are concerned then I will request you to go through uh, this particular website of South Asia network on dams rivers and people. So, uh, this is SANDRP. So, definitely you should uh, um, go through their website and they uh, publish their uh, journal every month uh, which is called uh, dams rivers and people and it is a very fascinating and a radical uh, you know organization and if you go through the uh, publications and the reports uh, of uh, SANDRP you will get to know what is going on across the country. Yes. So, and finally like uh, one has to keep in mind that like uh, international uh, interlinking of uh, rivers like ILR multipurpose river valley development projects uh, also uh, I mean um, uh, uh, also explored uh, basin scale South Asian basin scale complexities and challenges. Because as I had um, argued earlier also that this we have to keep in mind that these uh, you know water resources these rivers these are not only the river of a particular nation, but these are shared rivers. So, the question is what next? So, uh, we by, uh, know by now that the situation is alarming and uh, I mean the data is shocking, 
but then what do we need to do what are we up to so uh, am i here to only uh, let you know or you know uh, am i here to only uh, increase your anxiety about what is going on uh, so far as water sector uh, in india is concerned it's not that we also need to come up with of course possible uh, solutions we also need to uh, come up with uh, recommendations that should work at scale and that should uh, enable uh, and ensure our desirable sustainable future but the way a scientist a natural scientist or a, you know a engineer or a technical person will provide uh, solutions will be very different from a way uh, the social scientists would try to provide recommendations and solutions and then finally i will say whether you know there can be some uh, convergence across natural sciences and social sciences and whether we can really come up with some comprehensive solutions uh, which will um, uh, really be able to ameliorate the water situation that the country is uh, in countering or undergoing right now so so these are few questions uh, that we really need to think at so question number 1 where lies solutions for the south asian water challenges so now once we have uh, seen uh, the uh, once we are aware with the situation the immediate next question is what are the things that we need to do uh, i mean uh, to come up with effective solutions so where lies the solutions that we need to find out so do small scale cost effective local mechanisms knowledge technology expertise offer river mouths so as i mentioned that we of course south asia has a, or had a rich tradition of ecological knowledge humanistic knowledge and then the question is uh, when we are thinking about solution is it also imminent to go back and look into those array of practices uh, that were already existing within the south asian context now so yes related to this what can we learn from our past so it's a direct question of what we can learn from our predecessors from our past now is it a fruitful exercise to explore and learn from pre colonial water harvesting practice and techniques uh, techniques that are believed to have retained the water society metabolism for centuries now of course again i'm saying we will debate on this because i mean uh, to uh, make this kind of a, a conclusion or this kind of an argument that uh, uh, the water techniques uh, or water harvesting practices during the pre colonial times i mean it had no problem at all uh, so far as uh, technological uh, questions or so far as societal questions were concerned so but at least i mean we will see that whether this particular belief that it retained water society metabolism is true or not so again as i mentioned that we will uh, not try to uh, i will not try to give you uh, linear conclusions or i will not try to you know generalize uh, things but we would definitely debate on we will also i would very much encourage interactions and exchanges relating to whether uh, this colonial uh, equilibrium versus uh, co i mean pre colonial equilibrium versus colonial hydrology this binary categorization is valid or not and finally do these pre colonial techniques and practices have the potential to get implemented at scales during contemporary times this is again uh, you know as an environmental uh, i mean as um, uh, a person coming from the environmental uh, history background or discipline this is a question a very pertinent question that i would like to raise that uh, once we start exploring this pre colonial techniques and practices once we start understanding uh, the values in it once we start you know uh, uh, getting excited about uh, the uh, about about the different components of these pre colonial practices then the next question is uh, Uh, i mean though these are small scale though these uh, are cost effective so uh, when we will know this uh, by exploring these practices then the question would be whether these i mean uh, there is scope for these to get implemented today within the south asian context considering the south asian complexities during our recent times so with this i will just give you a glimpse of the course coverage so far as south asian waters is concerned so i will uh, cover uh, in a couple of lectures pre colonial water scenario so when i'll be shedding light on the pre colonial water scenario it uh, will not only mean the ancient period but it will also have a lot of coverage on the medieval period as well because pre colonials it's a broad term which means the uh, i mean the entire uh, historical time frame before the coming of the british so it will include definitely the ancient and also the medieval period uh followed by i would uh, uh discuss in detail again in uh, uh, one or two lectures the colonial water management policies followed by 
post independent multi purpose river valley development project. Now, when I will be covering post independent multi purpose river valley development projects, I mean broadly the construction of dams and barrages, then I will also focus on the anti dam resistance and protest, because this is also very important because uh, from the perspective of social science, because uh, like these anti dam uh, resistance and protest movements like for, uh, for that matter Narmada Bachao Andalan or Silent Valley movement or you know uh, the movement against the Tehri dam, this is very important because uh, this fall. Uh, you know within the ambit of what is known as uh, new social movements uh, that is the social movements of our recent times. So, uh, we also need to know uh, not only about the uh, history of these uh, dams or you know barrage construction, but we also need to know how the people also are trying hard different people different organizations the you know the, the people who will be di who uh, will be directly affected by the project the uh, students the uh, people from you know academia policy makers they are also coming to the forefront and uh, uh, you know trying to uh, uh, mobilize uh, the other people and they are also trying to put a whole lot of pressure on the government asking the government not to pursue uh, some of these projects because these projects uh, will have catastrophic and disastrous impact on ecology and society. So, whether this movement has been successful or not, so why successful, why not successful. So, it is very important for us to take a look into the nature and pattern of these uh, you know uh, new social movements. So, I do not know whether I will be able to do justice. Uh, to the entire coverage or not, but at least I will tr uh, try to touch upon uh, this anti ram resistance uh, movements or the protest movements and then uh, you will have lot of scope to go uh, into further detail by leading uh, by going through the reference lists. And then another uh, area which uh, has to be definitely covered uh, is the urban uh, urban context because the urban scene is important. We have also seen in that Niti Aayog uh, composite water management index that they uh, I mean the report says that by 2020 almost 21 cities 21 Indian cities would be uh, lacking access to drinking water. So, this is the scenario. So, on, on one hand the urban area is continuously increasing and expanding and on the other hand you know we are lacking uh, basic amenities, basic utilities like portable drinking water and sanitation. So, we need to cover urban waters and uh, I will uh, of course, talk about uh, how urban environmental history and how political ecology frameworks and perspectives can be important uh, methodological uh, you know tools and methodological uh, uh, frameworks for us uh, to understand uh, or to you know identify and trace the urban water challenges and also not only to identify challenges, but also to uh, find out and explore potentials within each and every city. So, each city has its own story, it is important for us to uh, know this and important for us to explore regional sp specificities and variables as well. Finally, there will be one lecture or presentation on peri-urban water justice uh, in the global south and here uh, I mean uh, I mean it is a kind of a cross cutting uh, comparative study. So, though uh, the focus is on South Asia, but here uh, I will be able to uh, tell you stories from uh, one city from Latin America and one city uh, from Africa, then we will be in a position to compare uh, what is going on uh, in the uh, peri-urban uh, sphere, because peri-urban is also another thing which needs to be considered these days, because uh, peri-urban also is a kind of a contemporary connotation. So, it means that uh, the cities I mean the areas uh, which were rural yesterday and which will be urban tomorrow and which are today in the zone of transition. So, uh, I mean they are uh, getting urbanized, but unfortunately uh, you know they are not being able to uh, enjoy uh, some of the basic amenities that otherwise uh, the cities enjoy. So, uh, this is basically a syndrome which can be best uh, uh, categorized as or conceptualized as urbanization without infrastructure and this without infrastructure also include lack of uh, municipal water supply arrangement. So, what is happening? So, when these water supply arrangements are lacking in these peri-urban areas, what are the ways, what are the coping mechanism or strategies through which the uh, people themselves are uh, devising new ways coming up with alternative uh, solutions to meet their daily daily needs of water. So, this is also an area that I will be uh, um, uh, covering. So, this is uh, um, I mean uh, the uh, course coverage with uh, the uh, um, South Asian focus in mind.
And uh, the final point is that, uh, of course, uh, so we had uh, discussed uh, all these frameworks in these um, uh, previous lectures. So, I had covered the uh, ongoing theoretical frameworks on, um, on you know, uh, ecosystem resources, more importantly water, like uh, I have talked about uh, political ecology, I had talked about uh, socio hydrology, I had talked about hydrosocial and also critical physical so geography. So, it will be a challenging, but yet I think a very fruitful and exciting venture or an exercise to mobilize this emerging theoretical context within the you know South Asian context. So, I am not saying this a course will uh, be able to justice to everything that I am trying to promise here, but what I will say is that at least it will give you a perspective which I mean through which you can get a clear cut picture and then you can do your own research and uh, you, uh, you will get some directions that how can you. Uh, understand and explore a particular problem and how can you really try to come up with comprehensive solutions. So, this is the ultimate purpose of the course and these are some of the references. Thank you.